All right, good to see you here this morning at Liberty Baptist Church. Doing okay today? Doing all right? Amen. Praise the Lord. Beautiful day the Lord has on tap for us. And um, we are thankful for the 116 that were in Sunday school this morning. And um, Zandy wanted to share a little bit about Sunday school, some of the uh, things that are going on and some updates. So we'll let you go ahead and come now. And I think he and I have the same shirt. Thank goodness for text messaging. It worked out well today. So I think uh, very often um, maybe we don't celebrate enough. And so just wanted to let you know that, you know, every Sunday morning there are 16 people meet in 16 different classes in our two buildings here to study God's Word. So it's pretty amazing to think about that we come together to see how God is moving among us and inspiring us and working in our lives not only on Sunday mornings but throughout the week and throughout our lives from the, as we grow from the times that we are children throughout our adult lives and as we uh, prepare to do God's will uh, at work and in our families and uh, wherever he leads us throughout our weeks. Um, so got a couple of questions then. We're having classes that join in uh, small groups to, to work together, to learn together. How is he leading us? And, and if I wasn't here this week, well, where will I be next week? Who will I join with and study with next week? How am I growing as a disciple as a result of being here? And, and then for the future, as we're looking forward, for example, to homecoming next week, looking at the past, how is God leading us to an even more glorious future? And so as part of that, in Sunday school, it's not really about school. I spend my week in a public school. It's not really about that in Sunday school. It's about going to God's Word, about growing together with other Christians, and being a stronger disciple by becoming a, a mirror, by attempting to become a closer reflection of Jesus Christ. So we encourage you to be here with your friends, your family of faith, and growing together with us. We're excited. Thank you. Thank you, Zandy. You mentioned homecoming. Homecoming is next Sunday, so there's no Sunday school. No evening service. We're going to start at 1030. So if you get here at 11, uh, you're going to miss out on something. We, we don't know. We're, we're still working on the order of service, but um, it is our 160th anniversary as a church. So there's going to be some special emphases with a video. I, we've got some special bookmarks that we're going to be uh, distributing. And we're looking forward to music by Baba Hatchie. Did I say that right, Baba Hatchie? And um, there's going to be, it's going to be Olivia and maybe eight or nine or something. We don't know. Okay, Colt. Okay. So, so there's going to be several uh, people that have uh, family uh, here that are going to be uh, in that group uh, sharing with us and leading us. And it's great to see young people who are... Uh, dedicated to uh, spreading the word through music. So we're looking forward to hearing them. And then Dr. Randy Davis, who is the head of our Tennessee Baptist Convention, he'll be here to speak. And we're going to have a meal after we get through, okay? I said, I didn't say at 12 noon, I said after we get through, okay? So we got a little extra stuff. But uh, we need folks to sign up to bring a dish, okay? So there's a sign-up sheet out there, and so as you're leaving this morning, if you could kind of swing by there, and as you're leaving, we'll have offering plates out there so that you can give to the Hurricane Harvey Relief. You can um, put your cash or your check if you want credit for your uh, record contribution. We have these ivory, they're a little bit different shape, but they're ivory uh, colored envelopes, please use those if you can. Several of you picked those up last week as you were leaving. And while you're going out and giving to the love offering, and while you're going out 
and signing up for a meal, the help with the meal. You can also look at a uh, listing of the folks who had their pictures taken for the directory. We're getting very close to being able to publish that and be able to distribute that. But we want to be sure we have all of our addresses, phone numbers correct. So those sheets are laid out there on the reception desk. If you go by there and, and write OK or do a correction, the uh, directory committee would really appreciate it. Please be in prayer for outreach as we have uh, our time of going out on Tuesday night. And then Wednesday night, we have all of our regular activities. Building uh, Grounds and Cemetery Committee is going to be meeting after prayer meeting in the conference room, 745 or thereabouts. And I think that's about everything we needed to share. Um, I'm just very excited about all that God is doing. And this morning, as we go to the Lord in prayer, we just need to ask Him to touch our hearts and to strengthen us for the week ahead. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, today we come to You and we acknowledge that You are God, You are created the universe, but also that You are a loving Father who is good to us and cares about us. We thank You for the salvation that you have provided to us. And I, I pray for those who are here this morning that do not know you as Savior and Lord, and I pray that today that they could make a decision for you. Heavenly Father, we pray continually for our folks who are uh, working in disaster relief uh, as part of our Tennessee Baptist uh, disaster relief teams. They're down in Florida, down in Texas, Louisiana, helping out, uh, reaching out to those who are in need and Lord, help us to support that work as, uh, as we leave this place today. As we worship here this morning, Heavenly Father, touch our hearts with your love, and we just pray, Heavenly Father, that we will leave this place with a sense of mission of how we can better serve you, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I encourage you to stand as we sing hymn number 386. Brethren, we have met to worship. singing this morning. Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Amen, it is. As we continue to sing songs of worship uh, this morning, a beautiful 
hymn that we uh, started singing two weeks ago, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. somebody near you this morning.
we've been singing about worship here in this place, and we sing songs of worship to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hymn number 312, 312, Jesus, your name, the reason we sing these songs of worship this morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the beautiful sunny day we have to worship you. Another day in your house, Lord, what a blessing it is. Lord, bless these tithes and offerings. Bless Pastor Paul as he leads. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.
Thank you, Joella. This morning, I invite you to turn in God's Word to Isaiah chapter 17. Isaiah chapter 17. We're going to be looking at some verses here that are a part of Isaiah's ministry. The first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah were written uh, to the present situation in which uh, Isaiah was ministering to and uh, the southern kingdom, Judah, and calling forth pronouncements of judgment against the various uh, nations and kings who had fought against uh, the southern kingdom, but also making a strong case for Judah needing to be faithful to God. In that day, a man will look to his maker, and his eyes will have respect for the Holy One of Israel. He will not look to the altars, the work of his hands. He will not respect what his fingers have made, nor the wooden idols, nor the incense altars. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, help us that we would know where to look in our times of difficulty and trouble. Help us to be attuned to your will and to your spirit in our lives. As you're moving in our midst, Lord, help us to have spiritual sight to see you working in our lives, in our church, in our world. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Abraham Lincoln was on his way to Washington, D.C. after having been elected President of the United States. States were already succeeding from the Union. The task before him was heavy and difficult. And this is what he told those who were gathered in Springfield, Illinois, as he was leaving. He said, my friends, I now leave not knowing when, or if ever I may return, with a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. Without the assistance of that divine being who ever attended him, I cannot succeed. Without that assistance, I cannot fail. I thought that was a very interesting statement made by someone who I think just about everybody would regard to be the greatest president that we ever had. Are we looking to God in the midst of our struggles, our difficulties, the challenges that we face every day? God is looking after us. God is looking over us. But are we looking to Him? As Isaiah is writing these words of prophecy... He is speaking to a nation that is full of idolatry. He's speaking to a nation of people who had become self-absorbed and prideful. They were people who thought they were self-reliant, that they could do it all themselves. And even when they worshipped, they worshipped at altars other than for God, or they worshipped objects that represented God, but did not represent who God really was. So I want to talk about the folly of idolatry. We today think of ourselves as above idolatry. We don't idolize anything, but I'm not sure that that is really true. We idolize sometimes our jobs or education or our money, our position. We sometimes idolize people around us. Maybe you saw that special on Princess Diana, seven days, the seven days between when she died and the funeral. And there was one point where Prince William shares that they were walking behind the casket going to Westminster Cathedral And he said the people were crying out. And he said he wondered why people were crying like that. He said, I'm the one that lost my mother, not them. But what had happened was people had idolized this lady. And 
that idol was now gone. And to show you how much idolatry there was, you know, Mother Teresa died just a few days later, and it was as if it didn't really matter. I think we live in times where people idolize what is urban. And, you know, when, when you live in a rural area like we do, we get overlooked sometimes, and people have preconceptions. When, when I was at First Baptist Clinton and I uh, was telling a dear friend that I was moving to Morgan County, he made a statement to me that I've shared with a few of you that I think is pretty funny. He said, well... You know, all those people in Morgan County, they know how to use dynamite. Really? Oh, yeah. They all, they all have dynamite in their garage. Really? All of them? Every single one? Oh, yeah. 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 And uh, he said, you're going to a wild place up there. And uh, I said, well, Lord, you know, Lord led me. And where do people have trouble getting medical help? It's in rural areas. The rural areas in our country are ignored. They even call it flyover areas, the politicians do. Kind of fly over and ignore us. And yet, I remember some of my best times being with my grandparents who lived, one in a small town and one in a very rural area. And what a way of life is the way I look at it. Where there's community, where there's a sense of belonging, where there's love, where there's compassion, where people take care of each other. To me, that's something that, that ought to be idealized, not idolized, but idealized. In the time of, of Hezekiah, who, this, who was king during part of this time, he became very much of a crusader for God. And what he did was these altars that were at the high places, some of them to Baal, some of them to other gods, there in that part of the world, he tore them down. And it's interesting when you look in 2 Kings chapter 18, you want to maybe look this up sometimes, but maybe you remember the bronze serpent, the bronze serpent that God told Moses to fashion and to make when the people of Israel had sinned and he sent all of these uh, you know, vipers to kill the people. And the people are saying, oh, Moses, help us. And so he prayed to God, and God said, make a bronze serpent. It was, would have been in the form of a viper. Put it on a, on a pole and then lift it up. And then when people look at it, they'll be saved from the snake bite. And that's what they did. And it's made allusion to in John chapter 3. You may want to read that sometime where it says that the sun be lifted up, right? Well, that's, it was that same illusion, just as that bronze serpent. Well, what's amazing is that thing still existed. They had kept up with it, and they were burning incense to it, and so Hezekiah said, no more of this idol worship, and he destroyed it. So what we have to realize is that there's the God who exists, and then there's the God who's in our mind, and so... Why do we need God's Word? Why do we need biblical preaching and teaching? It's because our minds are so limited, and God and who He is and what He does is so infinite that we need to continue to allow God's Word and God's Spirit to help expand our minds to understand more and more about who God is and how He operates and how we are to live. And so in Isaiah chapter 17, it talks about how there's going to be punishment to Damascus, which would have been Syria, the northern kingdom, Israel, the northern kingdom. And this is what he says, In that day a man will look to his maker and his eyes will have respect for the Holy One of Israel. He will not look to the altars, the works of his hands. He will not respect what his fingers have made, nor the wooden images nor the incense altars. And it was an incense altar where they had that bronze serpent and they burned incense to it every day. Do we see how God is working? Do we respect how God is operating in this universe? We need to ask ourselves, what do we idolize? 
because anything that we put above God or we let that lead us in our lives, what we think is right, what we think is appropriate, what we think is how we ought to live, that becomes an idol rather than God's will. And in our society, money is the big thing. And whenever the, the lottery jackpot gets real big, you'll hear people who've never played lottery say, well, you know, I may just do it this one time. Oh, okay, so you're going to take, you know, there's going to be, there's millions of people bought tickets and you're thinking this one time you can, you know, spend $2 or $5 and you're going to be the one that's going to get it. You know, I don't think it's going to work like that, okay? And you hear these stories of people who win these lotteries. You know, this is their dream and they find out that it's a nightmare. Back in 1996, uh, it was reported about a fellow by the name of Buddy Post. In 1988, he won uh, $16.2 million in the Pennsylvania lottery, which, you know, people don't even, you know, they don't even, some people don't even buy tickets when it's $16 million. You know, they want to go for the big jackpot, right? And this is what he said. Since then, he's been convicted of assault. His sixth wife left him. His brother was convicted of trying to kill him and his landlady successfully sued him for one-third of the jackpot. You know, how does that happen? And this is what he said. He was, he was a former carnival worker and cook. He said, money didn't change me. It changed people around me that I knew that I thought cared a little bit about me, but they only cared about my money. And he basically lost all the money that he, that he received. When we first moved to Clinton, I heard about the guy who worked at McDonald's there in Clinton who won the jackpot and he had bought all these uh, businesses and boats and stuff around uh, Nor you know, Norris Lake and then he ended up almost in bankruptcy. We need to realize that when we follow some type of idol, when we follow something that is not God's will for our lives, it will lead us to a place where we don't want to go and it's going to cost us more than we ever thought it was going to. So the folly of idolatry, we have it today and we need to understand that. There's also the folly of human ingenuity. And part of this relates to what Isaiah was saying, that which you make with your hands, with your fingers, and in chapter 22, verse 11, you will see a very interesting statement here. And I want to kind of give you some context for this. It says, You also made a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool, but you did not look at its master, nor did you have respect for him who fashioned it long ago. You might be reading that and go, what in the world is he talking about? Well, we know that in 701 B.C. that the Assyrian army had surround, was getting ready to surround Jerusalem. And so King Hezekiah thought, if we're going to survive a siege, which was the way a lot of warfare was done back in those days, basically what you would do is if you wanted to take over a city, you didn't go attack it first thing. You surrounded it and you cut off all the supplies going in and you would starve them out and make them thirsty because they couldn't get the water supply. Well, at that particular time, Jerusalem did not have a natural water supply. They had to go to the Gion Spring to bring water from outside the city wall into the city. So what Hezekiah did was he got some workers to follow a fissure that was in the rock and they, they started down at that pool of Gihon, and then they started at the at inside Jerusalem, and they followed this this seam in the rock, and they joined together, and they made a water tunnel. And I've got a picture of it here. You can't see it very well. That's a picture I took. But this tunnel is about six feet high, and it's two and a half feet wide in some places. Now, in this particular place. I had you have to kind of scoot like this to get through there. And they actually have an upper and a lower tunnel. And this was the first time I went to Israel. When, uh, when we got to the place where it forks off, some people said, I want to go through the lower tunnel. Well, that's where there's water there. And they came out and they had water above their knees. And I already was cold and I thought, I'm not going to go do that. 
but it ends up at the Pool of Siloam. And I've got a picture of that here. It's a little sign there. And another thing that they did was not only brought water into this pool, but the way city walls were made back in those days, you would have the outer wall, and then there would be an inner wall, and then people would build between those inner walls, they would build apartments, dwelling places where they could live. And so Hezekiah told some of those people to evacuate their homes, kind of like when they flood for TVA around here, you know, in East Tennessee, and they filled actually that cavity, it was about 30 feet in some places, filled that cavity with water. So they had this tremendous reservoir of water and that spring fed the water into the city. And so they were able to survive the Assyrian assault on their city and they went back home. And so a lot of people are going, hey, look at us. You know, look, look, look what happened. With our ingenuity, we were able to make this happen. And they forget that it was God who sent the Assyrian army home. He was the one who protected them. And that's why in, in those verses it said, oh, you know, you didn't look to the maker who made all of this, didn't have respect, that same word comes up, for him who fashioned it long ago. God was the one who put that spring there. And God was the one who allowed them to have that water supply to survive that attack. Look with me at another verse, Psalm 20. Psalm 20, verse 7. There's some, there's some variations of translations, but I, I think New James, New King James gets it very well. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember, or you can also translate, trust the name of the Lord, our God. Very powerful statement. How many times are we trusting in something that we see, but we're not trusting in the promises of God? We're not trusting in the strength and grace and direction that God can give us. And so many times in our lives, we're in the mess we're in because we trusted in something else, which in a way is saying we're trusting in some type of idol or we've idolized something or we've idealized something and we've not trusted in God. God provides us with so many blessings. Amen? So many blessings. I mean, even on my worst day, I say, Lord, I know I deserve a lot worse. I, I deserve a lot worse. You know, I get a whole lot more than what I deserve. Well, God provides us with salvation. You cannot save yourself. You cannot pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You can't do enough good to go to God when you die and say, God, look at all this work I did for the church. Look at all the tithing that I did. Look at the people that I, that I took to the Lord. Look how much better I am than other people. None of that will save you because we are all born in sin. We all are sinful. And that spot that we have, whether it be a little one or a big one, disqualifies us from heaven. But what are we told in Romans chapter verse 6 for when we were still without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly when we were still without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly it's kind of like one time Nathan the future missionary climbed up in a tree that we had told him don't do that don't get that high so he got up there and he became kind of like the way cats get. Well, I could climb up here, but how am I going to get down? Those branches seem like really easy places to grab a hold of or put my foot on, but I don't remember where I did that, and it's going to be a lot harder getting down. And so I remember being there and I said, and I, I told him, now put your foot there. Now grab that branch, now put your foot there, now grab that branch. And then I said, 
and just fall into my arms. One of my great memories. He grabbed my neck and says, Daddy, I love you. He could not get himself out of that tree. We can't get ourselves out of our sin. We need God's help. We need Jesus Christ. We need his blood, his righteous washing us of our sin. And we need to fall into his arms. That's the only way for salvation. You can't earn it. You have to reach for it and let God catch you. And I pray today that if you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, oh my goodness, it is so important, so important. Nothing else is more important. No other decision matters more than that, to be right with God and to know Him as your Savior and Lord. And the Bible makes it very clear that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that the wages of sin is death, but they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you call upon Him from your heart, asking Him for salvation, He will give it to you. But we need more than salvation, don't we? We need to know what to do in different situations. We need wisdom. And what are we told in James chapter 1, verse 5? Some of you may have these memorized. Some of you may have these underlined. Bob Cox always saying, Pastor, every scripture you shared today is underlined in my Bible. So we'll see about today. <laughs> We're probably striking a, 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 hundred, a thousand right now. Okay, 100%. James chapter 5, verse, I mean, verse, uh, verse 5 of chapter 1. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, look at this, who gives to all, stingingly, sparingly, no, gives to all liberally. That's the only time it's good to be liberal is when you're given, okay? To, 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 who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, let's think about this. If you ask, you need wisdom, he's going to give it to you liberally. He's going to give you the knowledge that you need, the understanding, the discernment, the insights you need in order to deal with whatever problem, stress, difficulty, challenge. There is an answer there, my friends. There is an answer. What you have to do is you have to be open to the answer. A lot of times we're not open to the answer, but there's an answer there. Because God gives us wisdom liberally. Okay? But look also how he gives it, without reproach. Now that's important. In other words, okay, you're in this mess. You're, you've got this problem. You've got this sticky situation. And so God gives us wisdom, but then he doesn't say, well, now don't do it again. Well, he probably does say that. But he doesn't say, now you're a naughty person. Why did you let this happen? I tell you about this, without reproach. It means that he gives it with, without shaming you. Okay? Without shaming you. We live in a society that, boy, there is so much shaming, and people especially like to do it from the anonymity of their phone or their computer. We're going we're gonna to just... You know, we're going to land blast everybody. And sometimes we forget that the best way to handle things is in person. And if you don't have the guts to say it in person, then you don't need to be saying it all. You need to pray God will help you deal with it. Without reproach, it will be given to him. That's a promise that God gives us. It's a promise no matter what we're dealing with, God's going to help us. So the decision might be which house to live in, what's your job going to be, your career, who to marry, what car to drive. God has a will for all those things. And if we make the decisions in accordance with his will, he will be glorified in it. And that's the whole purpose of why Christians live. Are we glorifying him in what we do? And then God gives us his Helping presence. You know, if we have salvation and if we have guidance, but without a personal relationship with God and longing for Him, life's not worth it. I mean, just knowing He's with us. How many times does, 
does, uh, do we see in the Bible where God is saying, you know, don't worry, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. There's, I mean, isn't, isn't being with you, isn't that what it's all about? It's kind of like when, when uh, John was about two years old. I told something about Nathan, so I'll t- tell something about John. Well, we were trying to get him to sleep in his own bed. And so um, I don't even know why we went through this struggle. But anyway, there'd be many times that we'd wake up and there he was. He'd brought his blanket in and, and he was laying on the floor next to our bed. The presence. Do we long to be with God like that? That we receive comfort and assurance by being close to him? Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. Don't think that the Bible does not understand our pain, our struggle, our challenges, our difficulties. Right there. We've all been there, haven't we? We've all been there where our food was our tears because you physically did not feel like eating and you couldn't stop crying. And you had to drink a lot of water just to replenish your tears so you could cry some more. David understands that. God understands that. It's preserved for us in Scripture. My tears have been my food day and night. While they continually say to me, the skeptics, the enemies, the people who are negative, where is your God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept a pilgrimage feast. Why are you downcast, O my soul? See, we all have these voices in us that, we, that the self-talk, and you can see that David is consoling himself. He's reminding himself about the truth of God's power, God's presence, God's salvation. Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. For the help of his countenance. Are you looking to God? Because let me guarantee you, he's looking down at you. Are you relying upon God? He will help us to be faithful. In 1490, there were two friends, Albert Durer and Franz. They were struggling artists. They could not both learn to do art and survive. So they drew straws. One person would go to art school, the other would work, and then when the first one had gotten through their art school, then they would then start working and support the other. So they'd go to art school. Well, Abig Durer, if you will, won the pull of the straws. And so Franz went to work and... Albert Durer went all over Europe looking at the greatest paintings and drawings and sculptures. And and so when it came time for Albert to support Franz, Franz's hands were no longer able to do the delicate drawing and brush strokes. And it was heartbreaking for Albert to think that his friend could no longer become the artist he had hoped to be. And one day, as Albert was thinking about this, he saw Franz with his hands like this, praying. Praying for him, actually. And it inspired the drawing, the praying hands. Got a picture of it. People who are art critics say that couldn't have been Franz's hands because his hands should have been all gnarled and and, uh, broken from the bricks and the mortar. But I think what Albert Durer did was 
he showed the hands the way that he saw them, as beautiful hands lifting up beautiful prayers to a beautiful God. That's what he saw. So my friends, no matter what you're going through in life, God understands. God loves you. God cares for you. His character, his nature has not changed. Pray to him. Pray to him. He'll give you salvation. He'll give you wisdom. He'll give you his presence. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the promises of your word. The promises that there's always an answer to whatever question life brings to us. Thankful that whatever need we have in our lives, that you have a response that is loving and compassionate. Help us, Heavenly Father, in the times in which we are downcast in our souls. Help us to be reminded of your great promises and of your great love. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our invitational hymn this morning is number 413, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. If you need to accept Christ as Lord and Savior, we've already discussed about how you do that. And I would love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you need to join our church and to join our fellowship of believers. We invite you to come as God leads. God loves us. God cares about every single one of you. And I invite you to respond to him as God's leading. Let's stand as we sing.